the think tank, the, the youth led think tank that, that deals with uh, Greater Europe in the world. We are very pleased to have uh, Dr. Koenig today with us, where she will talk about a project called the Virtual Museum of Peace, especially now those days, this eternal dream of a peace in the world, world peace is something that we can't take for granted anymore. And especially the European idea was built on the principle of peace. Nevertheless, currently the war in Ukraine has put some kind of shock or some doubts if, the, if, if peace, especially in Europe, can be taken for granted. In that sense, this museum is not just a collection. It's not just something where people um, spend time to watch artifacts. It's also a place of ideas, a place to dream, to understand, and a place to change. In that sense, we are happy to have Dr. Ellis Koenig today with us, where she will talk about peace, more than just the absence of war, but how different cultures deal with peace, that peace is not just the absence of war, but different ways of mediating conflicts, different ways of keeping societies together. In that sense, once again, thanks, Mr. Ms. Koenig, for being here with us, and I grant you the floor. Many thanks, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, it's really interesting to find out a bit about the Institute for Greater Europe, um, and uh, of course, in peace building, um, uh, as as for many other global um, challenges. Um, involving young people in the conversation is very, very important. Um, and there is a lot of work, um, as I'm sure you're aware, the UN's Youth Peace Security Agenda um, is gaining traction mostly in the global south, actually not so much in the global north, in terms of involving youth voices, young people, um, as um, experts through experience in peace building. Um, now, I'm not sure if I can yet, I can't yet share my screen. So I wonder if that's possible so I can show some slides. Um, brilliant, thank you. Um, so hopefully everyone can see my slides and I'll just try to get the actual slideshow working. Um, so, is that visible to everyone? Great stuff. Yes. So, I've titled my talk... Do you guys how you visualise peace? Although that's one of the things that I hope you'll be thinking about during this talk. Um, but just to, to really underline that asking other people that question is a really important conversation starter. Um, because we have very entrenched habits of visualizing peace. And one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is that actually we have quite limited habits of visualizing peace um, and really exploring with other people in conversation, in dialogue, um, different approaches to understanding, imagining, describing and working towards peace is one of the most important conversations any of us can ever have. Um, so just a little bit of context. Um, I run a, a, an interdisciplinary research project at the University of St Andrews called Visualizing War and Peace. And in a nutshell, we're interested in different habits of understanding, imagining and describing war and peace. And above all, in what impact those habits have in the real world. So a lot of people working in conflict studies focus on political, technological or strategic factors. Our work revolves around storytelling in lots of different media the tales we tell about war and peace in novels and in film, the pictures we paint through art or photography, the images evoked in music, the information conveyed through news reports and so on. In our view, analysis of the stories that we share about war and peace and their impact on how people think, feel and behave is just as important to our understanding and prevention of armed conflict as the study of historic facts or current capabilities. And that's because stories are world building. What do I mean by that? Well, people have been narrating and representing war and its aftermath ever since humans first came into contact and conflict with each other. And I'm a Roman historian, so I do um, dive deep into the ancient past. War stories are one of the oldest forms of storytelling from epic poems to cave paintings to ancient sculpture. 
Many descriptions and depictions of conflict reflect reality up to a point. They reflect what has been going on, but they also help to generate reality by shaping individual and collective mindsets and behaviors. So think for instance of a typical war memorial. It evokes events in the past, but it also generates an emotional reaction in us and it encourages us to take away certain ideas about war, its impact and its aftermath, which then go on to shape how we respond to veterans, what military action we might vote for or protest against in future, even whether we decide to join an army ourselves. Now, each war story does this on its own up to a point. But war memorials, war art, war films, novels, news reports and so on also interact with each other, nuance and reinforce each other across space and time, and they have a huge impact on us cumulatively. And one of the things which the Visualising War and Peace project does is to take a very long view of this, going back into deep history and analysing the impact of narratives of war and peace from antiquity to the present day. And by tracking the evolution and interplay of different trends in storytelling, we're able to reconstruct how shared and culturally specific ideas about war and peace develop and how they draw on, but also influence and even canonize wider habits of thought, for example, about leadership, about sacrifice, about masculinity, nationhood, trauma or justifiable or unjustifiable levels of violence. So. These are habits of thought that we studied that are cemented by lots of storytelling, which in turn affect and not just reflect how individuals and groups think and feel and behave. Now, we've seen this very vividly in Ukraine um, most recently. Obviously, there are lots of other examples, but I'm picking on Ukraine because it's, it's a particularly recent one. So people's experiences on the ground in Ukraine and outsiders understanding of what's going on there are constantly being mediated by reference to both historic and fictional narratives of war, from accounts of the Holodomor, the terror famine that decimated Ukraine in the 1930s, to images of Aleppo, another city in Syria that has borne the brunt of Russian um, uh, uh, weapons, to allusions to well-known World War I or World War II films or events, to comparisons with ancient legends like Sparta, even comparisons with Star Wars. Crucially, people are feeling certain things, deciding certain things and doing certain things like donating to humanitarian organizations, donating to Ukraine's military, signing up to fight, stepping forward to help your refugees because of the verbal and visual narratives that are being shared, not just because of what is happening on the ground. So it's the storytelling around events that's really helping to catalyze certain behaviors. Narratives of all sorts are mediating how everyone near and far visualizes, engages with and experiences the war in Ukraine, and that is true for every war. Different forms of storytelling are also shaping people's ideas of and attitudes and hopes for an actual work towards peace in Ukraine. So on this slide, and I, these are just, uh, uh, you know, I've almost picked these narratives um, at random. But on this slide, you can see a couple of drawings by young people submitted in 2020 to the charity Never Such Innocence, a charity which gives children and young people a voice on conflict. The picture on the left is called Molotov Cocktail for Peace. And it both reflects the artist's understanding that peace has to be fought for, and also perpetuates it, heroizing civilians who take up arms in defense of their country. This image depicts some real and some slightly idealized events in the past in a way that validates them for, for the future, encouraging their replication. The picture in the center depicts a very different kind of peacemaking, the temporary calm found by individuals amid the debris of war when they sit close and make music. Again, this painting evokes a real lived experience, but it also conveys powerful messages to viewers about human resilience, the need for inner peace, and the healing qualities of music, culture, compassion, and care. So it not only depicts a moment in time experienced by two individuals, but it enshrines ideas about peacemaking that viewers might celebrate, re narrate and even enact themselves at some point in the future. The text to the right was released last week by the International Olympic Committee to mark the anniversary of Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine. And it argues that the Olympics as an institution can model and promote peace by fostering dialogue and building bridges between different people and nations. 
It draws on an incredibly selective version of history and a very self-interested concept of peace building to stake a claim for the Olympic movement as an agent in peace building, even as it acknowledges that the Olympic Games cannot prevent wars. Now, this is actually quite a cynical form of storytelling because it's designed to pave the way for the IOC to readmit Belarusian and Russian Federation athletes uh, um, into the competitive arena. And it harnesses certain discourses of peace building centered around dialogue while eliding the vital importance of accountability, reparations, forgiveness and justice. The point is, though, because of their platform, this statement by the IOC not only reflects certain ideas of peace, but will help to perpetuate them, shaping how other people think that peace can or ought to be achieved. It will likely be quoted by other people arguing for inclusion and dialogue over exclusion and sanctions, for example. So it's another example of storytelling about peace that draws on past narratives and will have ripple effects in the future as different interest groups continue to debate how best to achieve peace in and for Ukraine. So in a nutshell, these are the kinds of things which the Visualising War and Peace Project studies. Um, sorry, I'm just going to admit someone who um, looks like they're trying to get in, uh, um, which I think I've got access to. So in a nutshell, this is what the Visualising War and Peace Project studies, the stories that we tell about war and peace and the impact that they have on how people think, feel and behave. Put another way, we're interested in the constant feedback loop between narrative and reality, the ways in which stories of war and peace reflect reality, as I've said, but also help to shape and generate it because they influence our mindsets um, and our behaviours. And there are important real world applications to our work. In studying past and present war stories, we hope to raise awareness of the very powerful ideologies which they generate over time, which influence all, all influence us all as individuals, institutions, and societies. So, for example, you know the way in which they um, promote perhaps militarized masculine identities, which have an impact not just in the in, in the context of conflict, but actually in the domestic setting. Um, we also hope to build capacity in individuals and groups to harness narratives of war to help prevent or mitigate against the effects of future conflict. Because as I say, stories are world building, they can function as powerful positive interventions in how and if conflict gets pursued or avoided. And we think that sharing more stories and generating more conversation about peace is a particularly important endeavor. And that brings me to the project that I really want to focus on today. Um, uh, the de our development of a virtual museum of peace. Um, and, and that intro hopefully just helps you understand the research background to why we decided to develop a museum of peace that disseminates lots of different representations of, and ideas of peace. And in particular, invites visitors to look critically at them, not just to accept them, but really to question um, and, and think critically about the different visualizations of peace that we have in different parts of the world. Um, and just a quick note that if you want to find out more about the Visualising War and Peace project, um, we do run a podcast um, and there are lots of episodes there. Um, at the moment, we've particularly got a series that's looking at visualising forced migration as one of the legacies of conflict. But we've got plenty of material also on visualising peace in that. So I want to introduce our virtual Museum of Peace properly in a minute, but first I want to take you on a very quick virtual tour through a real physical space, which is the ground floor of the British Museum in London. Now, if you were to visit the British Museum and walk through the main entrance and turn left, you would find yourself in the galleries that house artifacts from ancient Greece and Rome and from the ancient Near East. And I'm particularly interested in those because of my background as an ancient historian. So in these galleries, you find marble statues, remnants of temples and tombs, great sculptural re reliefs, pieces of armour and weaponry, painted vases, items of jewellery and lots of other objects. Everywhere you look, from the carved stone panels that once adorned palaces in Nimrud and Nineveh, to Greek temple friezes, to domestic pots and pans, you can see spears brittling, swords drawn, archers flexing their bows, chariots driving into battle, and infantry and cavalry, men and mythical creatures locked in mortal combat. Some war dead are mourned, others are triumphed over. Combat captives are marched in columns and gods of war are invoked. 
There are also some scenes of leisure, hunting, feasting, music making, and a few glimpses of civic, religious, and domestic life far from the battlefield. But you will struggle to find any self-conscious representations of peace or peace building on display beyond some very limited narratives of conflict resolution that are inherent in images of victory or celebrations of conquest. So what happens is that visitors to this museum and many, many others quickly become literate in the iconography of war and violence. And items in multiple rooms in the museum join forces to tell a story that draws really compelling, persuasive connections between favorable gods, strong arm politics, military force and community prosperity. By contrast, ideas of peace, what it looked like, how it was experienced and how it was made, remain blurred, out of focus, really hard to visualize. Now that is not simply because many of the artifacts on display in these galleries mythologize war or amplify top-down forms of conflict resolution and the advantages of belligerent leadership, though they do. For centuries, the curation of these artifacts by museums has allowed elite perspectives, geopolitics, and an obsession with empire to dominate. So information board after information board focuses our attention on those in power, on threats to their sovereignty, on shifting territorial boundaries, and on stories of imperial expansion or decline. And I've just selected a few taken directly um, as quotes from some of the um, info boards in the British Museum there. And, and what they do is they build a picture of human history in which great civilizations lurch from one conflict to the next of in between times of war's aftermath, the lull between clashes, periods of peace, we can see remarkably little. References to trade, agriculture, and artistic production tend to be framed in relation to war, as threatened by it or as byproducts of imperial expansion. And the work that individuals and communities did to navigate, avoid, or recover from the conflicts of their era is hardly touched on. And we cannot place all the blame on the artifacts themselves. Opportunities have been missed in the curation and communication process to raise questions about habits of visualizing war, which these objects promote, and to explore ancient experiences and discourses of peace. Now, this is not a strange quirk either of antiquity or of this particular museum. And I'm, not, I'm really not out to get the British Museum here. Um, it, it, it's an example, it's a case study in multiple um, museums. In the 21st century, we're surrounded by images and narratives of war, but we're exposed to far fewer representations or discussions of peace. It's not the case that such representations don't exist, but they're not framed or foregrounded in ways that impact our consciousness as much as narratives of war do. So as John Gittings, among others, has observed, if you walk into the average high street bookshop, you will likely find a military history section. And literally, I live in a very small town in St Andrews, so I walked into my local bookshop and there's the picture. Um, they've got a history section and then they've got a military history section and no other different sections apart from fiction and you know science fiction and cookery and whatever. Um, so you'll find a military history section, but you're very unlikely to find equivalent shell space devoted to, for example, the politics of peace. Now, that might be more true in some parts of the world than, than others. And I'd be very interested to hear if there are countries where you come from, where actually you find more bookshops which do give more shell space to peace. Lots of bookshops do stock both fact and fiction titles that reflect on different aspects of peace and peacemaking, from inner peace to international negotiations, but they're usually dispersed across different sections in a bookshop, so they're not easily visible, they're not accessible or promoted in the way that clusters of books on war are, and arguably you could take a bunch of the titles that are in military history and put them in a section on peacemaking. Um, equally, you know, um, war poetry, for example, some of that's anti-war poetry, some of that might actually be kind of reframed as peace poetry and get us thinking about peace, but that doesn't happen very much at the moment. Taking, turning to another genre, if, if a, a quick browse for films online will turn up hundreds under the very popular category war film, a best-selling genre that constructs and deconstructs war in many different guises, making it feel close, familiar, known, while socialising us into viewing it for and as entertainment. 
By contrast, films that narrate post-conflict recovery, reconciliation, harmonious living, future aspirations, friendship across divides, and other such aspects of finding or making peace do not have a recognizable classification that unites or amplifies them. Scattered across comedy, period drama, action adventure, fantasy, science fiction, and romance, they get us thinking about all sorts of phenomena, but they're rarely produced or marketed in ways that bring peace itself into focus. Peace art and peace journalism, peace reporting, are, are more established endeavors. Um, even so, they don't have the same centuries old traditions behind them as war art and war reporting, and they've not gained as much traction amongst commissioners or consumers. Um, the scholar Frank Muller makes a similar point about war and peace photography. Um, it, there's plenty of war photography, but you know, we don't think of much of it as peace photography. Why does this matter? Well, one objection to setting up uh, peace films as a meaningful category might be that the range of works that we might classify under that label is too nebulous and too difficult to determine. Arguably, though, one reason for this is that we just don't have strong traditions of peace storytelling, which would help us recognize peace when we see it and make us more peace literate. So the more we discuss and explore a concept, the more opportunities we have to understand it. But the reverse is also true. The media that shape us individually and collectively rarely get us wrestling with peace as a concept. And as a result, we do struggle to visualize it or grasp it in really deep ways. And so fewer stories are told about it. And so the cycle goes on. And actually, um, this photo on this slide here is so when I went to the British Museum, one of the, you know, I ended up, I ended up chatting to some curators and saying, you know, where can I find images of peace in this museum? And one curator said, oh, there is a brilliant thing. Um, it's called the Tree of Life. Um, guess where it was? Literally almost in the basement, right? It was on the lower ground floor tucked away in a, in a relatively dark space. Um, where, uh, um, you know, various material from parts of Africa is kept. Um, it, you really had to go and look, you had to find the back stairs and go down and really, really look for it. it it's an amazing um, sculpture made out of guns um, and other weapons that were handed in as part of an amnesty um, at the end of um, the civil war in Mozambique. Um, so, our Museum of Peace aims to make a modest contribution to wider efforts to render peace and peacemaking more visible, more discussed and better understood. This virtual exhibition space uh, has been designed and developed by a student research team. And as I've noted, is already, is, is, as I've already noted, is grounded in an understanding of narratives as world building. So our aim is to harness the power of story sharing to illuminate different habits of visualizing peace and their influence, actual or potential, on how it is experienced, promoted, created and sustained. For us, visualizing war and peace goes well beyond simply picturing either. It involves evoking, figuring, engendering and ultimately realizing them, narrating peace into certain ways of being. And what we like to think is that our project is both disruptive of entrenched habits of imagining and understanding peace, and also generative of new or different ways of thinking about it and, and of working towards peace. By juxtaposing a myriad or a kaleidoscope of different manifestations of peace, we want to question and challenge and stretch assumptions and interpretative frameworks. And we hope that our array of exhibits not only helps to make peace more visible and more broadly understood, but also more tangible and more realizable in the everyday. And I think it's an important point to make that a, a lot of our exhibits do focus on everyday forms of peace. Um, there are examples and entries in there that are about international negotiations, peace treaties and so on, very top down peace building. Um, but a lot of our exhibits also focus on uh, how individuals have made and imagined peace in their ordinary everyday lives. So that hopefully does make it quite tangible. So as you'll see, if you browse through our galleries, we've organized our contents into eight different virtual rooms. And I've put a list of their titles on one side of the slide and then just um, the introduction to a couple of those rooms in the main bit of the slide. 
Um, and these virtual rooms pose questions to the visitor about different aspects of peace and peace building. So what distinguishes peacekeeping from peacemaking? How do we visualize post-conflict recovery from physical rebuilding all the way through to inner healing? Uh, um, what role do campaigning and activism play in peace building and what other ways have humans found to build and nurture peace in our homes, in our communities and in the wider world? Um, what kinds of people do we associate with peace and peace building? Just politicians or all sorts of other people? What gender, what age group, uh, what parts of the world? And whose perspectives on peace tend to get marginalized? What challenges and opportunities does the digital age bring for peacekeeping? How might climate change affect the ways in which we understand and build peace? And what conversations do we need to have about peace in outer space as that domain becomes increasingly commercialized and weaponized? So in each room, a wide range of entries connected with each topic helps the visitor to explore these big questions, big questions, as I say, which hopefully then have a tangible connection to our everyday lives. Um, and the sheer diversity of contents from political theory to comedy to art to inner peace education, digital media, music, fashion, environmentalism, hopefully underlines the many different ways in which peace can be understood, imagined, promoted and produced by both groups and individuals, including each one of us. Um, as I said, the development of this virtual Museum of Peace has been very much a collaborative endeavour, and we've really benefited from a diversity of backgrounds in our team. So the members of our student and staff body come from lots of different countries, ethnic groups, religions, socioeconomic classes and educational systems. Even so, we're aware that we are still very much positioned within a very privileged space in Western and particularly British academia. Um, and for that reason, we've thought really carefully about how to increase viewpoint diversity, how to incorporate and include a wide range of voices, experiences and positions so that privileged ideas of peace don't dominate as they have done for such a long time. Now, that's inevitably a work in progress. Um, but as we continue to add new entries, we really are trying to ensure broader representation across genders, across generations. So we have some very you know, young voices in there as well as much older voices, for example, cultural, across cultural and religious identities. So we do have items that reflect on different religious um, conceptualizations of peace, for example, across different regions, socioeconomic backgrounds and life experiences. Most of the museum's creators have experienced very high levels of peace in their lives and very little conflict. Um, so we have really tried to think very hard about the ethics of visualizing peace for others in ways that speak to multiple complex experiences, not just our own. So we've been really asking ourselves whose experiences and ideas of peace are we allowing to take center stage, but also what models or definitions should we give space to from belligerent forms of securitization, and we do have an item or two on that, you know, so when, you know, UN peacekeepers or the Pentagon get involved in peacemaking, um, to campaigns for human rights and social justice and equality, activism, present and past, to uprising and revolution when peacemaking actually looks quite violent, um, to care for others and for the environment. And when I say care for others, sending love letters, um, that kind of thing, as well as uh, um, more uh, um, institutional caring roles. One per it is, we find it very important to keep reminding ourselves that one person's security might be another person's repression. And we're seeing that, for example, in places like Iran right now. One person's pacifism might pave the way for another person's colonization. And that's a dilemma thrown up for many in connection with Ukraine, for example. And I've got a quotation um, on, on this slide um, where you know, there are two scholars who, as feminists, um, have always been um, very much against militarization, very much against the weapons industry and so on. But as Ukrainians have come to believe that pacifism will kill. Um, so we're trying to reflect the lived experience of many different people who find themselves in complex, compromised, conflicting situations and not just impose our rather privileged experiences of peace. Now, some peace museums do push very, very particular agenda. The Peace Museum in Bradford in the UK, for example, has strong connections with the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Our approach is not to promote certain visions of peace ahead of others, but rather to expose to critical uh, um, observation 
the many different understandings and approaches that different humans have experimented with over the years. And it's a sample, it's not a survey. Um, but what we really want to do is put together a valuable archive or a repository of options of different pathways to peace that we can continue to explore in the future, aware of their many shortcomings. Um, uh, 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 depending very much on individual circumstances and, and the conditions of any particular conflict. If we've learned anything from our curation of different concepts of peace, it's that it can be understood and achieved in an extraordinary range of ways. And we do want to celebrate that because it's a pretty empowering message actually in the face of so much conflict. Lots of theories, lots of academic theories in particular on peace building, pitch different methods against each other. So in international relations theory, um, there's a bit of a kind of battle going on between top down peace building approaches and grassroots or bottom up peace building approaches, for example, that's a you know oversimplification, but you know, academia does tend to pitch one approach uh, uh, against another. Um, but at what, what we hope our museum does is help us see that peacemaking is creative, it's opportunistic sometimes, it's experimental, it's sometimes accidental, it's sometimes very challenging, often very, very challenging, it's sometimes controversial, it's contentious, it's imperfect, and it's always evolving. And we think that having an archive of contrasting approaches, which are not promoted one ahead of another, is a rich resource for us all to draw on, whether we're peace practitioners or simply ordinary people going on about our everyday lives, to get us thinking critically about different approaches and the different things that we can enact and engender through conversation, through dialogue, um, and also through action. Um, so while we're a university-based research team, we have, as I say, made a really conscious effort to listen to voices beyond academia and to explore representations of peace in less mainstream media. So we do do a lot of research um, into scholarship and scholarly ideas of peace building in all sorts of different disciplines. And that's actually been really, really interesting to explore, to compare how history as a discipline, for example, understands and studies peace and peacemaking compared to international relations or compared to social anthropology or compared to art history, for example. Um, but we, we, we've been very interested in exploring these less mainstream media and, and, and non-academic voices. So our museum features graffiti, it features children's drawings, it features music, dance, online gaming, yogic practices, cyber activism, environmental movements, fashion, prayer, poetry, film, novels, history, political debate, and as I say, scholarship. While academics undoubtedly play an important role in shaping our understanding of and approaches to peace, the world of university research can sometimes feel detached from practical or societal concerns, and peace practitioners can find critical theory quite difficult to access or implement on the ground. As noted above, as, as I've already said, um, storytelling in popular media does play a very, very important role in shaping and cementing ideas of and attitudes to war and peace. And that's another reason why it's important that our museum brings these different voices into dialogue because of the power of popular media, not just academic scholarship. Um, so we're aiming to bridge divides between scholars, pra practitioners, storytellers, and story consumers via an inclusive conversation space. And, and we do think that you know, a really cross-cutting conversation is very important, a cross-cutting conversation space is very important because peace is conceived and made by all of us, not just by experts, and dare I say, at least of all by experts. Um, it, it is something that people, all sorts of people have to invest in. There are a really interesting number of peace museums that exist physically around the globe, um, like the International Peace Museum, which is in the States, or the Kyoto Museum for World Peace. Um, uh, there's a really fascinating peace museum in Sierra Leone in Freetown, for example, which has a very interesting history. Um, of course, as physical spaces, access to them is necessarily limited to those who either live in the area or have the means to travel. However large, their physical dimensions also set a limit to the volume, range and kinds of materials that can be on display. Our online platform has limitations itself, but it also has some different merits um, in so far as it does democratise access um, because it enables everyone with an internet connection to explore. 
And we're also very keen to invite the visitor to become a co-curator with us by offering opportunities for feedback, new suggestions and interaction. As you see, um, if you browse our exhibits, each entry ends with a set of questions. What do you think? Um, really designed to prompt reflection and elicit responses. Um, uh, what we really want is for visitors to see each entry as the start of a conversation, not the final say on something with us and with each other. We really genuinely do want to have people feed back and tell us what they think, how that particular item resonated with them, or whether it did or not. Um, and you know, we're very, very keen as well. We, um, as part of our feedback form, we ask people to suggest new entries, new items that they think um, would be good to include in, um, in the museum. Our digital platform um, then hopefully involves quite an interactive experience for the visitor as well as an inclusive one. Um, and the, the digital platform with our sort of virtual themed room, you know, it has these virtual themed rooms, as I say, these eight themed rooms, but the, the virtual, the digital platform also allows us to present our conflict, our, our contents in a range of other configurations all at the same time that aren't possible in the physical space. So in a physical museum, you go into one room and those contents are there no matter what you do. In our museum, you can go into that room virtually, but you can also click on one of the tags, which takes you to a kind of different configuration, a different selection, a different juxtaposition of entries that pull different things from different rooms together. Um, and, and so, you know, and also each individual entry includes cross references and hyperlinks to other items in different parts of the museum that invite direct comparison. And as I say, our tagging system generates fresh juxtapositions um, with items that have been curated separately um, every time you click on a new tag. Um, and so through this mix of specific cross references and then much looser groupings, the mosaic of entries does genuinely become a kaleidoscope, that sort of toy that you play with as a child where every time you switch it, a sort of different picture comes into focus. Um, and I just popped on that slide, uh, you know, just a little outline of our, our mission statement. Um, so each contributor to the museum has added visualizations of piece that are based on their own areas of expertise and interest. And our team is made up, as I say, of people from all sorts of different disciplines, from film, film studies, from psychology, um, from modern languages, uh, comparative literature, art history, and, and so on. So we do have examples in the museum of top down peace building, but also of grassroots peace building. We have um, uh, uh, entries that are utopian and entries that are more dystopian. Um, we have really belligerent, revolutionary, potentially quite violent models of peace building alongside much more pacifist models, but also entries that really look at the challenges of pacifism. Um, we have really big geopolitical uh, entries, um, but also very, very personal um, experiences of peace, pockets of peace in a big geopolitical context, like pockets of peace in Ukraine, the way in which individuals within a conflict are finding moments of peace in their everyday. Um, and we've also, we're also looking at um, you know, uh, everything from aftermath of conflict all the way through to futures thinking and imagining a, a future world with peace and with no conflict. Um, some students have uh, developed creative projects of their own for the museum, so they've done their own graphic design based on their research, they've produced um, a, a dance um, that represents the, their understanding of peace, um, and we've also got other organisations and other individuals' visualisations of peace, like the Green Mosul Initiative, which um, is a, an environmental movement in Mosul that, that really connects uh, a climate um, action with peace building in a, in a city that's been ravaged by war. Um, the Hope in the Jar entry by Emily Mayhew um, really gets us thinking about um, society, about collaborative action, um, uh, uh, um, uh, cooperative work, um, among other things, and really visualizes peace in a really fascinating way through honey. Um, uh, I'm just going to talk through one, a couple of very specific entries, um, just as a sample um, to give you a flavour. So the entry that's on the slide right now um, is created by one of our students, Marius Diakurtis, um, who created some black and white drawings inspired by poems that reflect on the struggle to find peace after forced displacement. 
Um, and he's from Cyprus himself, so he's particularly anchored in um, a, a, a context of conflict and forced displacement there. As he explains, Picasso used the freedom and abstraction of modernism to show the complexity, chaos and atrocities of war. But I think, and I'm speaking as Marius now, he says, I think that peace can be just as complex and convoluted. So I chose to follow a similar style. And his black and white color scheme is designed to evoke, but also challenge black and white thinking about peace as simply the binary opposite of war. He's packed symbolism into his drawings, which aim to show that experiences of peace and war can be synchronous. And as he puts it, this is exactly how all the poets I've read visualize peace for refugees and forced migrants. They are liminal figures that mediate between conflict and peace. So he's done some creative work in response to poetry um, that's really trying to critique black and white habits of thought about peace as simply the binary of war um, and really get us thinking about the synchronous experience of war and peace, of conflict um, and um, efforts to rebuild after conflict, experienced by all sorts of people, but particularly by refugees. Um, and other items in our museum, as I've said, feature children's views on peace. Um, by the time we reach adulthood, we have often been socialized into very, very particular ways of thinking about peace. So if you live in the United Kingdom, like I do, for example, you grow up learning about and celebrating Armistice Day, Victory in Europe Day, as it's called, and other events and anniversaries that are connected with the end of the First and Second World Wars. Ideas of peace feature in the lyrics of popular music. Um, children read books and watch films like The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Beauty and the Beast, Harry Potter, The Lord of the Rings, stories which end happily with conflict resolution and calm after violence and disorder. But in none of those stories is the hard labour of peace building really explored. Alongside coverage of contemporary conflicts, young people may have seen footage of anti-war protests with an array of peace symbols from Picasso's iconic dove to the peace and love sign designed um, in the 1950s for the, for the CND. And they may have heard calls for world peace or community harmony in religious contexts. But we rarely ask how do children imagine, understand and describe peace themselves? The smells, tastes and sounds which they mentioned in conversations with our researchers made it clear how strongly the children we interviewed connected peace with two things, home and happiness. So lollipops, ice cream, macaroni and pie, comfort food and treats, hugs with their family were mentioned several times. They talked about peace sometimes as being quiet and contemplative, like when they were curled up with a book. But they also described uh, uh, um, peace as trampoline time, um, as doing front flips, as going to theme parks, playing with friends. So for them, peace was synonymous with the ingredients that make us happy, that, that make for a happy, secure childhood. In a nutshell, for them, peace is everyday fun. So that just gives you a flavour of a couple of the entries in the museum that are that that work quite hard at busting myths around habits of visualising peace. Between them, our museum entries really do help us rethink the connections that we often make between peace and nature, for example, between peace and love, between peace and justice, peace and women, peace and security, among many other pairings. And they get us thinking about historic, religious and culturally specific conceptualizations of peace alongside modern secular political and theoretical models. And the results, as I say, is hopefully a smorgasbord of different concepts, intellectual framings and imaginaries, local, regional and national. Individually, all the exhibits transcend the tropes, cliches and symbols traditionally associated with peace. And together, as they interact with each other, they challenge dominant concepts, they dismantle long-standing frameworks and they push us to consider visualisations of peace and mechanisms of peace building that are often overlooked. The structure of the museum, as I say, encourages visitors to, to explore really open-mindedly without a sense of tra trajectory or hierarchy. And we hope that each visit to the museum represents an ongoing process of critical discovery of many different conceptualizations of peace. Our contents are not to be taken didactically. They offer an opening to further interrogation and understanding. And as I said, we don't want this project to, to be the sort of the be all and end all of how one could or should visualize peace. Rather, it's a metaphorical call to lay down arms in a collaborative, open ended exploration of prevailing habits and alternative ways of picturing, framing, evoking and engendering peace through lots of different lenses. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, Dr. Koenig, for this very comprehensive talk about the museum. And it really gives a pleasure <clears throat> to visit the museum. And this is also some kind of invitation for the audience here. If you have time, take a little look at the Virtual Museum of Peace, where you can see all the diversity of what's behind the concept of peace. Um, are there any questions from the audience to this very comprehensive talk about visual uh, literacy, about peace literacy, and how to understand peace in its different forms? If there's no one who'd like to break the ice, I just would like, uh, Sam, please. Yeah, um, I actually have a question about something that you mentioned quite early at the start of your presentation when you were looking at the British Museum and how it's curated. And to what extent do you think that the problem with sort of prioritizing war over peace and museum curation is linked to imperialism or to museums and countries that used to have large colonial empires? Do you think that those countries struggle more with the idea of peace because war has been glorified for so long? Yeah, I, I think it's deeply, deeply enmeshed with um, colonial histories and habits of thinking. Um, so if we're taking specifically the Greco-Roman antiquities in the British Museum, of course, they are both imperialistic. Um, uh, they both have imperialistic histories themselves. Um, there's a very famous phrase, isn't there, which is histories written by the victors. So you could flip, you could, you could um, have a variation on that, which is that peace is depicted by the winners, by victors, by people in power. The, uh, the kinds of people who had the money and the, um, uh, uh, the, the opportunity to represent peacemaking processes, to represent victory, to represent war as well, um, are the people in power, are the elite voices. And of course, one of the things that they're interested in doing is celebrating um, their might, their power, and, and absolutely, uh, you know, shoring it up, really uh, um, grounding it. Um, but yes, it, it is the case, I think, that um, that museums with a history of uh, um, acquiring contents from different parts of the world through imperialism um, have a much harder job of looking at peace in uh, diverse ways that look at grassroots peace, that look at uh, everyday peace, because one of the things that you immediately have to do is you have to look at the voices of people who you have oppressed. Uh, you have to look at the hard experiences of people you've oppressed. You have to have a reckoning with the brutal parts of your history. Now, it's quite interesting to think about the, um, there's, a, there's a really wonderful museum in London called the Imperial War Museum, and it has got three of the most unpopular words in the English language in its title, um, Imperial War and Museum. Okay, so um, it was founded in the aftermath of World War I, and really in its founding, it was about um, capturing what, people in the British Empire experienced during that the Great War, so-called the Great War. Um, over its history, it has done a really interesting job of reckoning with the fact that, of course, Britain no longer has an empire, um, that it, it's just, for example, re, uh, um, redone its Second World War galleries to reflect the fact that this was a total global war that affected many people beyond Britain and really to try and explore how people on multiple sides of the conflict were affected. It is still the case that in the Imperial War Museum, peace is looked at though as security, as a belligerent kind of, you know, as top down um, a belligerent peace, but it's about, um, you know, having armies on the ground. It's about um, a, a sort of political architecture for peace. So there is some way to go, but that's a really interesting museum in, in the work that they've done over the years to reckon with that imperial past, to uh, um, make space for other voices, other, other experiences, but it is very much a work in progress. But you're absolutely right. Yes, the imperial past of certain museums, um, it, you know, is a barrier. The museum in Sierra Leone, the, the museum, um, there's a really interesting museum in Freetown in Sierra Leone, which was originally set up as a war memorial that was very militaristic and, and you know, had a lot of militaristic imagery. And about a year after it was opened, it was reimagined and renamed um, as more of a museum of peace um, and as a museum that was more inclusive and that, um, you know, okay, st it's still got some 
um, images of soldiers and it's still got the sort of traditional poppy from the Western world from, from you know, World War I, um, but it, it's made quite an effort to look at civil war in Sierra Leone um, through different lenses and, and um, different voices. So that's another really interesting museum to look at. Um, there are lots. Thanks for these, uh, bringing up these questions. Sir. Are there any other questions from the audience? If not, there was one question that was submitted by a Google form prior to this uh, talk. It's dealing especially with the concept of peace and democracy. So it says peace is often associated with the idea of democracy. And so this person is asking if that's not quite a Western point of view or why is democracy necessary but not sufficient for MPs? That's a really good question. And in fact, one of the um, people in our research team at the moment is, is, is specifically focusing on that very huge and very difficult question about the relationship between peace and democracy. Now, there are some regimes in the world um, which would argue that uh, you do not need democracy for peace, that... Um, uh, that uh, uh, um, a strong state can provide a secure environment for citizens to thrive in. Um, but the uh, um, characteristics of a strong state tend to be quite oppressive. Um, they uh, um, And they tend to be uh, um, oppressive in ways that uh, um, that challenge the freedoms of minorities in particular. Um, so there is the sort of slogan, no peace without justice. If you don't have social justice, if you don't have equality, if you don't have human rights, can you have peace? Um, so my personal position on this is that, you know, an authoritar authoritarian state is not, and never can be for the individual, for all the individuals who live within it, a peaceful state. But arguments can be made that it's a stable state, um, that it's a state that's not actively at war. But it does depend a little bit how we define conflict, how we define war. And, you know, conflict can be defined as, um, you, know, you know, armed political violence, um, but it can also be defined as racism. It can be defined as, uh, uh, you know, it can include knife crime on the streets. It can include, um, you know, violence against freedoms of speech, for example. Um, why isn't democracy sufficient for peace? Well, democracy, I, I, I think for uh, um, a number of decades in the West in particular, we have taken democracy for granted and not understood its fragility and the fact that democracy has to be worked at all the time. Um, and we, we have begun to understand that more since 2015, 2016, and you know, I don't want to get too political here, but you know, since the rise of Donald Trump, um, since the Brexit referendum in the UK, um, and the very polarized politics that um, have surrounded all of that. Um, uh, and you know, in the UK at the moment, I, I don't, you know, I think a lot of people would argue that democracy isn't very healthy at all. And one of the things that goes along with that, with an unhealthy democracy, is a lot more conflict, a lot more tension. Um, so, um, imperfect democracies create imperfect forms of peace. It, it, it's idealistic and utopian to think that we can kind of find ourselves into it in, in a perfect democracy, in a perfect peace. Um, I think ideals are worth working towards and visualizing, absolutely, um, because then we know what we're aiming at and, you know, we're, we're not getting cynical and we're not getting fatalistic. Um, but democracy and peace building are constant works in progress. And what they need, both of them, are all sorts of people in everyday lives working with integrity, thinking critically about them, critiquing the problems in them all the time. And, and in a sense, that's the definition of democracy, freedom of speech to critique, to contribute. Um, um, and in that sense, uh, to have one say, to be an agent, regardless of power, wealth, or, you know, the ethnic background or religious uh, affiliation. Um, uh, uh, and when those conditions are met, then that actually does tend to go much more hand in hand with um, 
with peace. One of the fundamental, when democracy is going well, several things happen. Um, so let's take an example from Ireland, where some referenda were held much more successfully than the Brexit referendum in the UK. So Ireland had, uh, has had a number of referenda about very contentious issues. And I'm talking about the Republic of Ireland here, not Northern Ireland. Um, so one of them was on um, gay marriage. Now, this is a Catholic country where um, gay marriage um, is something that people have very strong views about, and also a referendum on abortion, very strong views about on different, different sides. Um, but one of the things that happened in those referenda was um, a lot uh, was quite a bit of investment in citizen assemblies, in participatory democracy, in involving lots of people in extended conversation over time before a vote. And when you involve lots of voices and you create the conditions for responsible debate, where there is deeper mutual understanding on either side of different positions, um, one of the things that you prepare for is something called loser's consent where the people who lost the vote, where it didn't go their way, still have faith in the process and can understand and can accept, you know, that that was the majority view and that it was, you know, they haven't been robbed of anything that, they, that, that, that this was, you know, this is the will of the majority. So responsible debate, participatory democracy, um, citizens assemblies, uh, um, sort of shore up democracy, and reduce the drivers of conflict. They reduce polarization, they reduce othering, they reduce the sort of toxic, um, uh, 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 you know, sort of mudslinging um, and, and tribal politics. So investing in democracy, I do strongly believe is an investment in peace. Um, and so they do go hand in hand, but we have to work to both of them. That's a very long answer, sorry. No worries, and that's quite an important answer that democracy and peace, they are never given. They are always a process, not a simple product. If there are no other questions, then I have a final and concluding question. Having seen all the many artifacts the museum have, like beehiving, like even mangas, so lots of different artifacts, what is your kind of personal artifact if you stroll through the Virtual Museum of Peace? Oh, goodness, that's a really good question. Um, so I have, in a sense, I find it, you know, I do have some that I particularly love. Um, but I think the thing I most love about the museum is the way different entries completely surprise me. So I've created some entries within it, which represent how I kind of, where I thought I would find examples of peace. But I've loved the fact that um, other people on the team have created entries that have taken me by surprise, like an entry on hacktivism, for example, um, or, um, uh, you know, it never occurred to me that one of my students would do a sort of an interpretive dance to represent peace. Um, there are items on Quakerism and conscientious objectors, which are very interesting. And one of the things I do like about the museum is that there are some really brilliant um, entries, not enough yet, but brilliant entries that really go back in time. So we've got uh, um, someone who works a, a lot on sort of 17th century Scottish politics, for example, who's been really enjoying, an 18th century Scottish politics, who's been really enjoying diving into how um, peace was conceptualised by different factions in the Scottish Anglo Wars, for example. Um, and just that kind of that perspective from history um, and the marginalisation of voices in that era helps us understand a little bit more uh, about the 21st century. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to pull out one because I think it it, it would be a bit invidious. Um, uh, but just to say that it, it's it's the, the ones that have most struck me have the, are the ones that I found most unexpected that have really surprised me about. So, you know, Peace in Space. I loved the fact that a couple of people did a podcast on peace in outer space because I'd never really thought about um do we need to worry about peace in outer space? Well, yes, we do, it turns out, because it affects our everyday lives, our ability to get money out of a bank, you know, um, our ability to get, a, a, you know, a phone signal. Um, so, yeah, it's the sheer range and the fact that as a collaborative project, there have been so many people's different perspectives. Um, there are some really nice ones on, you know, there's a nice one I mentioned earlier on love letters as a as an initiative that started in the pandemic, for example. Um, 
that is just uh, and I think some of the ones I love the most are the ones that are really that, that offer us sort of tangible things that we can do in our everyday life like write a love letter um Equally, though, I really like the incredibly critical approach to Pentagon Peace Bells, which is one that was written by a colleague, um, you know, looking at the absurdity of going around the Pentagon and, um, you know, a, 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 a sort of big defense institution, but being able to buy a teddy that somehow, um, you know, makes us think that militarized forms of peace building are kind of soft and fluffy. Um, so that kind of critical um glare i think is really good so i just encourage you to dive in and see what really resonates with you and also what doesn't resonate with you and what makes you think twice and makes you think oh god i didn't that doesn't look like peace to me um because there are some where i think oh is that about peace um and then i have to sort of step back and think well actually yeah there are ways in which it is <laughs> Thanks also for this, and I see there's so many artifacts and so many things to discover. Um, I just got the message. Connor, do you have any question you'd like to ask? So last but not least, you will have the honor to ask the last question of this session to round it up and maybe find some solution to peace. I think it's a lot of pressure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can do that, but uh, I was just wondering, um, I thought it was really interesting when you kind of showed how um, images and depictions of war, you know, deep going back to ancient history, sort of like the drawings on the wall, like they have this sort of physical, they're fighting with spears and things and how, you know, even today our conception of war has kind of been influenced by these legends and even you're touching on like masculinity gets tied into it. And I was wondering, I suppose it hasn't really materialized as much in the conflict in Ukraine, but everybody has kind of been saying that, you know, conventional warfare is over, that the new type of war is going to be, you know, cyber warfare, biological warfare, all these sorts of things. And I was wondering, from that perspective, do you think if they do come in in the future, that will change how we think of war and military and maybe on kind of rebalance that between peace and war? Maybe we'll put less of this emphasis on war as the kind of war that we experience changes? I think it will really confuse the boundaries. So the first thing I want to say is that, um, you know, I run a Twitter account for visualizing war and peace. And of course, I have a lot of, I get a lot of war content as a result. And one of the things that's been really striking about the Ukraine conflict is how many tanks people are talking about, right? So the idea that we are just in an age of cyber warfare is wrong. We, there are Ukrainians right now fighting in trenches, okay? You know, we're going back over a hundred years. Um, these are very old forms of warfare and they're evoking conflicts in, uh, you know, they're evoking models of heroism, of self-sacrifice that go back to Sparta, that go back, you know, to the ancient Greek world. Uh, um, so the idea that conventional, as we call it, um, we, uh, um, mechanized warfare is a thing of the past is is a mistake and actually it's it was a big strategy mistake uh, you know everyone expected Russia to hit with massive cyber attacks they've hit with artillery um really brutal um deadly artillery okay so but alongside that yes cyber warfare is a thing cyber warfare is um accelerating fast and one of the things that I think it does is really confuse the boundaries between war and peace. So um, when a state hits the health providers in another state, that could be considered warfare. If a private security firm does that, is that just a crime? So if a private security firm is uh, you know, attacking the, the NHS in the UK in order to try and get them to pay a ransom to um, debug the system, is that actually, does that count as cyber warfare? Uh, or does it depend whether it's the state doing it, whether it's a sort of a, you know, and, and could that private security firm be actually a terrorist organization, or whatever. So, so the boundaries between what we might describe and what we might recognize as war and peace, I think will become increasingly blurred as war does, war is played out, conflict is played out much more in cyberspace, not just in outer space, but in cyberspace. Um, can that help us think um, differently about peace? Um, uh, um, yes, but I think it makes it harder. <laughs> In some ways, it makes it harder um, um, because it, uh, you know, it's um, 
when so peace building involves of course ceasefires and a cessation of conflict but it also involves rebuilding it involves um then justice it involves uh, ideally growth after conflict good peace building involves growth after conflict um so um I, I you know i think cyber does pose some really interesting challenges about how you recover from a cyber attack um uh, who's responsible for that where some of the justice actually takes place um how who we define as victims um so i think it opens up really really interesting and really important questions they're questions we're going to have to wrestle with i suppose one final thing to think about in terms of visualizing peace in the cyber context is ai so everyone's aware now of chat gpt or whatever it's called um being able to generate essays text whatever there's a lot of ai out there that can generate pictures as well one of the real um threats actually uh, of of the, the ai that generates um you know if i if i wanted if i sort of put into chat gpt P, gpt a question um what does peace look like it would come up with an essay but what kind of ideas would it come up with it would come up with the dominant ones it's a statistical algorithm right it aggregates the most common articulations of what peace looks like so one of the threats of cyber is that it's going to funnel us into really dominant rather than diverse ways of thinking about peace um and so i think that's probably the the thing i want to end on if that's okay so thanks a lot for taking the time, showing us all the diversity of peace. So peace is more than simply the absence of war. It's how different societies think about uh, the living together, how to live peacefully together. There are so many artifacts. And I say, because it's the internet, there are no closing times. Maybe after the call, you're interested to have a short visit at the World Show Museum of Peace. And this concludes our session for today. Once again, huge thanks to Dr. Koenig for taking the time and presenting the World Ship Museum of Peace for us. And hopefully I'll see you all again at the next event of the Institute for Greater Europe. Have a great evening. Thank you. And if you have any feedback, please fill in our feedback form. It would be really lovely to hear from you or suggestions. The Peace Museum is constantly growing, so there are new items that are popped in every week. Um, so it's an expanding archive. Thank you. Thanks a lot and see you all at the next event. Goodbye.